Ever since he revealed details about the cover-up of former Cardinal McCarrick's misdeeds, Archbishop Carlo Vigano has been making controversial statements about the state of the church and the state of the world. Should Catholics take him seriously or should he be ignored? That's what we're going to talk about today on Crisis Point. Hello, I'm Eric Sammons, your host and editor-in-chief of Crisis Magazine. Uh, before I get started, I just want to encourage people to like and subscribe to the channel, to, the, to this episode, wherever you might listen to us, where you might he uh, watch us. Uh, we really appreciate it. Also, you can follow us on various social media outlets at Crisis Mag, and also be sure to donate, if you can, to Crisis Magazine to, to help our work here. Just go to crisismagazine.com slash support. I think there's also a donate link up in the uh, menu up top as well. Okay, so like I said, we're going to talk about Archbishop Vigano. Uh, he's in the news, as he often is, whenever uh, there's a major event in the world, he often gives his his views on these events, and uh, it usually makes news what he says. I mean, to be honest, he, he's probably the most controversial bishop in the Catholic Church today, uh, not including the Pope, who's obviously a bishop as well, but he is as well. But, but Archbishop Vigano has, has really been uh, in the news a lot since 2018. Uh, Crisis Magazine has run two articles about him in the past week, one last week, which was critical, of him by Michael Warren Davis, and then one that was supportive of him by uh, Barbara Farah uh, just today. Uh, so I, I encourage you to read those. I'll, I'll try to put those in the show notes after uh, we, we get finished here uh, so you can get to them easily. Now, let's talk a little bit about Archbishop Vigano. I, I want to give some background information first because I think it's important. I think it's easy. In these cases, what happens is somebody like uh, a figure like Vigano becomes almost something that we all think we know, but we don't actually look at very much. We just see headlines and we think we know and we stereotype these people. They become caricatures. Sometimes they, they, they become caricatures of themselves. They become these caricatures. But what I want to do today is I want to dig in a little bit to what he's been saying over the past few years and really look at it from the perspective of, is this something legitimate that Catholics should follow? Is he being prophetic when he talks about the state of the world? Or is he just preposterous and saying things that are just crazy, like conspiracy theories that are just crazy? And, or is it something in between? That's what I want to really talk about. So first, I just want to give a little bit about his background. He was ordained in uh, 1968. He's, four, he's 81 years old. He was ordained in 1968, so right after uh, Vatican II. So he's, he's ordained right in the era, about the same time that, uh, if I remember correctly, Pope Francis was ordained. He's about the same age as well. Now, what's interesting is he started his service in the diplomatic corps of the Holy See in 1973. So only five years after being ordained, he was already a diplomat working for the Vatican. And I think that tells you something because his entire ecclesial career was in diplomacy. And so he, he's worked in, let me see, in Iraq and Kuwait, uh, Great Britain. Uh, he worked for the Secretary of State of Vatican City for a, a long time. Uh, where else has he been? Um, let me see, Nigeria. Uh, and then, of course, what he's most known for is that he was the apostolic nuncio to the United States from 2011 until 2016. And so he served there uh, for a, a number of years. In fact, I think I remember one time I was at the March for Life. I believe he came to the uh, march and gave, uh, gave a little talk before the Mass for Life beforehand. I, I think that was him uh, one time who did that. But so he, his career is as a diplomat. However, for most people, he was uh, completely unknown uh, to the world, to most Catholics. He was completely unknown until 2018. And that's when uh, he basically came out uh, uh, and, and revealed things about Cardinal, then Cardinal McCarrick, about his abuse and about his misdeeds to the world. And he, he basically named names of people who covered up for McCarrick. Now, I will say before that, in 2012, he was involved in the Vatty Leak scandal. Uh, he was one, a person who leaked information about Vatican misdeeds even then. So there was, it wasn't completely unheard of when he came out in 2018 with this information. But so in 2018, I just want to review that so people remember. And I believe it was May of 2018, maybe it was early June. The Archdiocese of New York basically admitted that, yes, there was a legitimate complaint against Cardinal McCarrick by, a, I think it was by a former seminarian, and, and they, they, they were going to investigate it. This then exploded very quickly. And so by in June, he was already removed from public ministry, uh, and, and that was known as the summer of McCarrick, 2018, 
uh, the summer of McCarrick Award. That's what Catholics were talking about all the time. Not just how terrible it was what McCarrick had done, but the fact that it was obvious that he had been he had been covered up for. There's no way he could have risen to such high ranks in the church and committed so many of these awful deeds and crimes and sins without people high up in the church knowing about it. But we didn't know who. We didn't we didn't have anything to really pin on anybody at that point. Then comes August. And in August of 2018, Archbishop Vigano, God bless him, he issues a letter, an 11-page letter, where he basically does detail what happened. He has this testimony. I have it right here. This testimony that he that he releases, and he basically names names. He talks about exactly what happened, that he knew about McCarrick. He told uh, Pope Francis about it. He names people like... Uh, Cardinal Whirl, the, the then uh, Bishop of uh, Cardinal Archbishop of Washington D.C., he was McCarrick's successor. He 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 says that that Whirl definitely knew what was going on. He says that Pope Francis knew about the allegations against McCarrick, and yet still lifted him up to a high level in the church uh, to to his advisor. He's a cardinal already, but what happened was is Pope Benedict basically sidelined him quietly. He did not come out and, and, and do anything real serious against McCarrick. I think that was a that's a blight on, on Pope Benedict's record, is that while he tried to silence him, he didn't actually do anything effective against McCarrick. And then when Pope Francis, when he came in, in, in into the papacy, he allowed McCarrick then to become one of his closest advisors. And, and Vigano names and says specifically that he told Pope Francis about the allegations and Pope Francis ignored him. And so this was a huge deal. I don't think I, I, people at the time realized, I think, but I think we're already forgetting what a big deal this was because the one thing you don't do as a Bishop, you don't go against other bishops. You do not name names like this. And, and especially for a diplomat. I mean, remember I, I just said he, he had been a diplomat his entire ecclesial career, almost since 1973, he had been a diplomat for the Holy See and there's one thing diplomats don't do. They don't name names. <laughs> they keep secrets. Yet he didn't. And this this was a bombshell. And it really did uh, set off a, a lot of things going on in the church about the corruption going on in the church. And also, I will I'll say that um, Vigano also named, I mean, he also even pointed back to, to JP2. Uh, eventually, that became, that, that became uh, something that happened as well. But then he wrote follow-up letters. So this was his first real public testimony. It was in it was in August of 2018. Then in September, and then again in October, he released more information. He he basically this ended up bringing down Cardinal Whirl, but the focus was completely on ecclesial corruption. He was not talking about politics at all at this point, and. What it did was it revealed to Catholics that there were deep levels of corruption in the Vatican. Now, the fact is, many of us suspected that. In fact, maybe a lot, I don't think the majority of Catholics, but people who pay attention to what's going on, they knew there was corruption going on. In fact, obviously, Pope Benedict, his resignation suggested this corruption that was going on. And we know of stories like Father Maciel of the, of the uh, Legionaries of Christ and all that was going on there. So we knew there was corruption going on, but this really blew the lid off of it. And so then Archbishop Vigano went into hiding and he said that there were there, he implied basically there were forces in the church that would try to eliminate him because he had information on them. And it was he was suggesting he had information he had not yet revealed to the world that was going to be even potentially even more controversial, more scandalous than what he'd already said at this point. So he went into hiding and he promised there to be more revelations to come. He, he said, the time has not yet come for me to release anything. So he's saying that he has things to release, but it's not yet appropriate for him to release them. I honestly, when he said that, I was a little bit, that, that was my first kind of like warning to me, like, wait a second, what does he mean by that? Because obviously if, for example, there's somebody doing something, abusing people, let's say there's another cardinal, another archbishop who's who's committing abuse, the time to release information is now. I mean, the second you know it, because you have to, otherwise he could continue his abuse. He could continue the corruption. But he said it wasn't time to release it. But we were all waiting. Catholic Grain, like, okay, Vigano. And now Vigano became, at this point, then a folk hero among Catholics, among Catholics who are really paying attention. To what's going on in the church, faithful Catholics. You had your V for Vigano uh, t-shirts and, and, and coffee mugs, and I, I saw it all. 
And really, he, he was a folk hero, rightfully so, because he had done something nobody else was willing to do. He was willing to name names and really work to expose the corruption going on at the highest levels of the church. And for that, we, you know, we, we should be very thankful, obviously. He also became a, v, a, a folk hero because I think of the, of the current reality that we live in in the church. We live in a situation where most of us, frankly, don't respect our bishops. They don't command respect. Now, we respect the office, the office of the, of the Episcopate, obviously, because that's the, the successors to the apostles. But we don't respect the men who are, are our bishops. And so, and we don't want, and they say things that just really don't inspire us and often are scandalous, often are even heretical, and we don't want anything to do with them. So when we, in this situation, what happens is we gravitate to those few bishops who do stand out because we know bishops are the successors of the apostles. We want to look up to them. We want them to be our leaders. So when a bishop like Bishop Snyder or, or Bishop Strickland or Bishop Cordelione or somebody like that speaks up for the truth, speaks up for uh, the church and for Christ, we gravitate towards them. We make them our guy. And th this is exactly what happened with Vigano, was he was doing something that was very, uh, to be commended highly. And so we we wanted to, we made him our guy. And and, and so th that that's something that just essentially is natural that that happened. Now, there is a danger to that as well, though. Once somebody becomes your guy, you have a, you have a, there's a temptation to become a, what I call a party Catholic. What I mean by that is not going out and partying, but instead like being part of a political party, like Republicans or the Democrats. A, a perfect example of this to me has always been Sean Hannity, that he is a perfect example of a party Republican. He will defend the Republican no matter what. He's not, he's not concerned about principles or specific uh, points of policy. It's To him, it's all about you just defend the party no matter what. And there's Democrats galore. I don't follow the Democrats at all or like MSNBC. That's why I don't know who they are. I guess Rachel Maddow, Maddow I guess she is one. Um, but the point is, is as Catholics, we, we, we have the danger of doing that, that when our guy, somebody becomes our guy, we defend him no matter what. And, and we and take any criticism of him uh, personally as well. I'll talk about that more in a little bit. Now, in a properly ordered church, in a, in a healthy church, the truth is we'd only listen to our own bishop. We'd only listen to our local ordinary, and, and we'd follow what he says. We'd say, okay, well, what, what does my bishop have to say? And I'll, I'll just follow that because it's going to be consistent with all the other bishops. We don't need to look for bishops in, in uh, Kagastan or in Italy or or in Texas, or in California, or anywhere like that. We just simply follow our own local bishop, because that, that bishop is teaching the Catholic faith, is proclaiming the gospel, is speaking out for truth. And so we just do that. But that's not the church we live in. We don't live in a healthy church right now. And so we're, we're, we're going to gravitate towards these, these men. And I'm not saying that's a bad thing. I'm just saying it's something we need to be careful about. I mean, I admit freely that I gravitate towards uh, Bishop Athanasius Schneider, and I think he's a, a great... Uh, man and, and somebody we should follow. But even then, he's still a man. He's not he's not somebody who is infallible. He's not somebody that we we become uh, our guy that we we don't accept any criticism of or we're unwilling to criticize him ourselves. And I think he would be the first to say that as well. Now, going back to Vigano. So after this happened, so he, he built up a lot of goodwill, uh, some, somewhat of a, a heroic status among many Catholics, but particularly traditional and conservative Catholics. Uh, in this summer of 2018, after he released in uh, August, September, October, and he said more is coming. But then what's interesting is he did a pivot. He really started talking much more about geopolitics than he did about church affairs. That's not to say he never talked about church affairs. In fact, in the summer of 2020, he talked a bit about Vatican II, and he suggested that we, that we uh, basically repudiate the council. We, we just ignore it. We, we forget about it. Uh, his quote was, we, we, he hopes a future pontiff would rejoin the threat of tradition where it was cut off. In the context, he's talking about being cut off by Vatican II. So it's not that he hasn't talked about uh, church affairs, but the primary thing he's talked about is geopolitics. He's talking about political, uh, particularly in America, but also in Europe and throughout the world and the impact of it. And I want to look at that a little bit because that's really what he's been talking about mostly. He's written a lot, actually, in, in the now um, going on almost four years since he really came to the limelight. 
but a lot of it's been about geopolitics. I want to focus on a few things he said because that will help us to understand what he's saying. And I think this is important. Again, let's not just characterize him and act like he's just a stereotype, but let's actually dig deep into what he's saying. So I want to look at a few things he wrote. One was in June of 2020. He wrote a letter to President Trump. So this would be during the camp. This is soon after COVID had started. Uh, so June of 2020 and during the, the presidential election year, of course. So right at this point, Biden, I think, was the, the we knew Biden was going to be the other nominee. Uh, but Trump was obviously going to be the, the, the nominee for the Republican Party for reelection. And something he writes in the first line of his letter to Trump in June, June 7th, 2020, really, I think, epitomizes the, the whole theme of what he writes about when he talks about geopolitics. He says, in recent months, we've been witnessing the formation of two opposing sides that I would call biblical, the children of light and the children of darkness. This is something very much in the in the writings of Vigano you see is he has this, this dichotomy, this idea of a battle between good and evil in the world. And that it's it's coming to a fore. He uses uh, apocalyptic language, and he makes it very clear that there are the children of light and the children of darkness, and and there's a battle going on for the the, the fate of the world for the future. And he talks about the in in the children of darkness. He uses examples, for example, the deep state. He talks. He, he mentions a deep state many times, and this is basically the people behind the people in power. People who are uh, the deep state in America, of course, it might be people high up in the CIA or other uh, government institutions that really influence the direction of our government, probably more so than than our the officials themselves do, the, the elected officials, I should say, do. And we saw that with President Trump when he came into power. He talked a lot about cleaning out the swamp, draining the swamp. And a lot of that was just he, I don't think he ever used the terms deep state state back then, but it was kind of that idea that there's a swamp in Washington, D.C. that needs to be cleaned out, that needs to be drained. And that's really the deep state. And so that's what uh, um, Archbishop Vigano is talking about here in this letter in 2020. He talks about COVID. And I will say this. He was one of the first to really uh, resist the COVID regime. He was one of the first, I should say, bishops to really resist it. And still probably one of the only ones because most bishops have accepted it hook, line and sinker. But he was one of the first to really push back against the COVID regime and, and see the dangers in it and how it was being used by the children of darkness, as he would call them. He talks about the riots, the, the Black Lives Matter riots. Uh, and he also then brings up the, the deep church. He uses the, the terminology of deep state and he talks about the deep church to basically talk about the same forces that happen in the bureaucratic halls of D.C. or happening in the bureaucratic halls of Rome that you have these people who are very influential within the church in the background who are influencing the direction of the church, perhaps different than how uh, even the Pope wants to go. And I think we, 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 he's, we saw this with, of course, Pope Benedict, that Pope Benedict, you could argue he was driven out. We don't know all the details, but there's a decent chance that there was there were things going on behind the scenes that led him uh, to, to resign back in 2013. And, and, in this letter, though, Vigano comes out clearly for Trump. He says, for the first time, the United States has in you a president who courageously defends the right to life, who is not ashamed to denounce the persecution of Christians throughout the world, who speaks of Jesus Christ and the right of citizens to freedom of worship. You're participating in the March for Life, and more recently, your proclamation of the month of April as a National Child Abuse Prevention Month are actions that confirm which side you wish to fight on. And I dare to believe that both of us are on the same side in this battle, albeit with different weapons. So here Vigano basically attaches himself to President Trump and says, President Trump is fighting for the children of light, as I am, as Archbishop Vigano is. He's fighting more against the deep space, the, I'm sorry, deep state, whereas Vigano is fighting against the deep church, supposedly, in, in what he's doing. So these themes of the children of the children of light, the children of darkness, this ap apocalyptic idea of a good forces of good versus force of evil in, in a in a maybe a final confrontation or at least a very major confrontation they loom large in everything that Vigano writes at this after this point again in um let me see in October of 2020 right before the election so this is just days before the election in 2020 he writes an open letter to President Donald Trump 
And again, he starts off by saying, allow me to address you at this hour in which the fate of the whole world is being threatened by a global conspiracy against God and humanity. Those are strong words, but they're words that are very, very typical for Archbishop Vigano. Again, it's this idea of a global conspiracy. Now, a, real, a quick word about conspiracies. I will admit that I have always had an inherent distrust of conspiracy theorists. I, I don't really like that idea, and, and I don't really follow people who do that. However, I have to admit the reality, which is that the so-called conspiracy theorists have a better batting average in predicting what's going on than the mainstream narrative is has. And so I think we can't just to just to, to just dismiss somebody as a conspiracy theorist these days. That's intellectually lazy. The fact is they've been right, the so-called conspiracy theorists, a lot. I mean, everything we about COVID practically was a conspiracy theory before it became a fact. And so we we can't just dismiss Vigano or anybody like him as a conspiracy theorist. That, that's laziness. We have to look at what he says and then look at what happens. But you see, though, he talks about there is a global conspiracy of God in humanity that, that is a, a, a major confrontation. The fate of the whole world, he says, is being threatened. And this letter, this is right before the election in October 2020, he talks about the Great Reset. Now, this is something I think we brought up here before, but I think most people are familiar with. It's this idea of the global elites basically reworking how society works. They would argue that the way the world is set up now, particularly the developed world, just doesn't work. There's too many people who are, are poor or, or whatever, and there's climate change coming. It's going to destroy the whole world. We need a reset. We need to rethink how we do everything. And this is something, this is terminology they use. This isn't terminology conspiracy theorists made up. This is their terminology. They want to reset how the world is run. And essentially, they, they make uh, capitalism, the free market, as the bad guy. And they, they advocate for a socialism, maybe not in word, but in deed. And so Vigano talks about this Great Reset. And he says the, imp the purpose of the Great Reset is the imposition, imposition of a health dictatorship. And, it, and the price of the concessions from the International Monetary Fund will be the renunciation of private property and adherence to the program of vaccination against COVID-19 and COVID-21 promoted by Bill Gates with the collaboration of the main pharmaceutical groups. He talks about digital ID, health passport. And so what he's basically warning President Trump is we need to really support you because you need to fight against the Great Reset crowd that's going to impose this dictatorship. And I'll, I'll t tell you the truth. I think there's a lot of wisdom in this. That's exactly what was going on and has is still going on with the COVID regime is an idea of a health dictatorship that would basically control our lives. I think that's that wasn't outlandish to think that or to argue that, uh, is particularly in October of 2020. Now, there has been a receding of the, the COVID uh, regime in recent months as we now have a new villain, which is Putin. But I think the point is still valid that there's a real danger of using these health crises as a way to control our lives. Then he also says, Mr. President, I imagine you're already aware that in some countries, the Great Reset will be activated between the end of this year, meaning 2020, and the first trimester of 2021. For this purpose, further lockdowns are planned, which will be officially justified by a supposed second and third wave of the pandemic. Now, this didn't come true exactly like he did, like he that Vigano predicted, but it was true that in 2021, there were more efforts to do more lockdowns. Uh, there, there were more efforts to, to drum up support for more con government control based upon new variants of the of the of the vac of the um, disease. There's obviously the push for the uh, vaccine. Then one other thing I want to mention about this October letter is he said in sacred scripture, St. Paul speaks to us as the one of the one who opposes the manifestation of the mystery of iniquity, the catacon. And this is a Greek word that basically it's a verb for hold back or resist. And so it's being used in the sense of one who holds back. And it's, it's in, in Vigano is using the idea of one who holds back the mystery of iniquity, the man of lawlessness, as St. Paul calls him. You could consider that the Antichrist, some would consider that, or maybe just somebody who's a great evil force in the world who's working against Jesus Christ. The idea that, that Archbishop Vigano is bringing up is there will be one or at least a small or, or individuals who will hold back that evil. And he's suggesting here that perhaps that is what uh, President Trump would be. He also then says in the religious sphere, 
This obstacle to evil is the church, and particularly the papacy in the political sphere is those who impede the establishment of the world, new world order. I want you to remember that, that he talks about in the church, the one who holds back the Catholic uh, catechon, we'll make sure I pronounce it correctly, probably still mispronounce it, is the papacy, the one who resists in the church. He says, remember that because I'm going to bring that back, that, that term up again later. But essentially, he's talking about President Trump as the one who would resist it. And so, obviously, we know what happened with the election. Uh, President Biden was declared the winner. There was a lot of controversy about that. And, and obviously, you know, I'm not going to re-litigate that, whether or not it's true or whether or not Biden actually won or not. There's actually new information that just came out, I think, today or yesterday that suggests there was a lot of funny business going on with the election. I've always thought that. But then in January, early January, before January 6, 2021, he did another, he did an interview, Archbishop Vigano did an interview with Steve Bannon, and he basically talks about, uh, they talk about the election some, and he does say, he suggests that there is a good chance that the election was fraudulent, that it was not, that Biden did not actually win. He says, I, I consider, I simply consider who Trump's adversary is and his numerous ties to China, the deep state, and the advocates of the globalist ideology. He's talking about Biden here, of course. It is essential that the victory of the one who's elected president, he's still talking about like it's a possibility it might be Trump, even though this is January 1st, 2021, must be guaranteed in its absolute legal legitimacy, avoiding any suspicion of fraud and taking note of the overwhelming evidence of irregularities that have emerged in several states. So he's basically saying we need to make sure this this election is legitimate. And he's also suggesting he wouldn't put it past Biden and his crew to engage in this because they're part of the deep state. If there's one thing the deep state is going to do, it's going to be fraudulent elections and doing things behind the scenes to overthrow legitimate elections. And so, again, oh, and also another thing I wanted to mention about this interview with Bannon, he's asked specifically who is behind the deep church because he's Bannon wants to know, okay, who are the people? You're talking about Biden and, and others in the deep state, but who's behind the deep church? And what's interesting is, Vigano does not give an answer. He does not. He does not say any names. He does not name any new names. So ever since he he came on the scene by naming names, since then he has not really named any names within the church of people who are pushing the so-called deep church. And I, I say I'm not saying so-called in, in a derogatory way. Uh, just a term he uses. I think there's nothing really wrong with the term. And so this is really an interesting point. Is that. Vigano has really, really inserted himself into the 2020 American election. And I do think there is a little bit about that that's a bit odd. He's an Italian archbishop. What does he have to say about American election? I mean, what does he have to do with it? But at the same time, I think he saw it as a major event for, for the world that the election of President, the re-election of President Trump would be would significantly hold back, be the, the catechism of holding back the great reset crowd, the deep state. And so when obviously now that we have President Biden, that would be a setback for, for Trump and for the forces of good, the children of light. And it would be a victory for the children of darkness. Now, more recently, and, and Vigano has written more than this, but these are some things I want to highlight because they, they, they talk about, they, they address his themes. But most recently, Archbishop Vigano released a declaration a 24-page declaration. Here I have it in my hands. You want to see it? Um, a 24-page declaration of Archbishop Carlo Maria Vigano, Archbishop, former apostolic nuncio to the United States of America on the Russian-Ukraine crisis. Now, one thing um, I, I want to note is that I think it's a little bit interesting that he decided to release a, it was called, he calls it a declaration. I will say that to, that, that was a little bit that, that rubbed me a bit the wrong way because it, it, it comes across a little bit self-important. I mean, all of it. Hey, I make a living opining about these things, talking about these, making my opinion known about these things. And who am I? I'm nobody. And so I'm not saying Archbishop Vigano can't make his uh, knowledge known to the world. He knows more than I do. He's been a diplomat for, for decades. But I do think there's a certain point where, where if you start releasing declarations, there is a danger that you're becoming self-important. That you're starting to see yourself as a figure that is that is a world figure that we all must listen to and we all must must follow, 
And so I do think that I'm a, I was a little bit concerned by that. That being said, I read the entire declaration. Like I said, it's 24 pages. And I think if you if you want to compare, for example, his declaration as far as giving information and a backgrounder of what's going on in Russia and Ukraine, if you want to compare that to just almost any media outlet out there, Veganos comes out on top. It's excellent in so many ways. I would say about 90% of it, I'm just nodding my head going, yep, this is right, yep. He does a great job of giving the background of what's going on in Ukraine. Most most people today, they, they don't know anything until that happened in Ukraine until January 2022. Basically, when Putin started threatening uh, war, that, that's the first they ever heard about it. They don't know anything about the coup that happened in 2014, about the history of Ukraine um, since the fall of the Soviet Union, about what's about the neo-Nazi influence in, the, in, in Ukraine, things like that. Nobody wants to talk about that now. Nobody even cares about it. But you, but Vigano does a great job of giving that background. He gives, he does a good job of explaining also, for example, the actions of NATO and, and what th- that have led to this situation. He talks about uh, he, he brings up the bio labs in Ukraine. And when he when he published this, that was still considered a crazy conspiracy theory. But now, of course, we all know there are bio labs in Ukraine, and they are something that the United States was involved in. And it's likely Hunter Biden the son of President Biden back when he was vice president was funneling money to them. That this isn't a conspiracy theory anymore. It, it's actual, a lot of this are facts, or at least they're, they're, they have a lot of evidence to support them. And major media publications are now reporting these things. And here's Vigano saying it before they all release it. So, so we have to give credit here where credit is due. And so what what Vigano does, though, is he he does in all of his writings, he puts it in the context of the Great Reset crowd, the children of darkness, the new world order. He puts it in the context of that trying to take over the world and those who are fighting against him. And essentially, I know people people have said that he came out sympathetic to, to, to Putin. And he and I think you could argue that maybe he does. I think what he sees, though, is he sees Putin as potentially a force that would be on the side for the children of good, even if of light, even if he himself is not a child of light, he could be used for that purpose. I think that's probably the best way to to uh, explain Vigano's point of view here is he sees uh, Putin as an instrument that could be used by the children of light because he's resisting the Great Reset crowd, the New World Order, the, the, the Western powers that have become so evil uh, in recent years, in recent decades. Now, I will say there was, and this is what the article by Michael Warren Davis last week was about uh, in Crisis Critical of him. I do think there was a section, though, that I, I found very troubling, uh, troubling about Vigano. It's, it's a section at the end called An Appeal to the Third Rome. Remember what I wrote, what, what he wrote, I'm sorry, back in 2020 about the papacy being the catechon, the, the, the one who holds back the, the man of iniquity, the man of lawlessness, the antichrist, the, the, the forces of darkness. And he said specifically it was the papacy in the church. And it was anybody who resists a new world order in the political sphere, meaning Trump or others like him who support, who, who back Trump. So the catacon is, according to Vigano in 2020, is the papacy. However, now he writes, the Rome of the Caesars and Popes is now deserted and silent. Just as for centuries, the second Rome of Constantinople has also been silent. Perhaps Providence has ordained that Moscow, the third Rome, will today in the sight of the world take on the role of the catacomb of eschatological obstacle to the Antichrist. This is a big shift, I think. I, I, it's possible, I want to give. I, I want to uh, be fair, it's possible Vigano is just using metaphorical language here, not necessarily theological language. But theologically, this is a huge shift. The term third Rome for Moscow that's, a th- that's an orthodox theological statement. I've, I've mentioned this before. And, and it means that, Ro- that Rome, the first, the old Rome, was replaced by the second Rome, the new Rome, Constantinople, when Rome fell into heresy. This is according to Eastern Orthodox theology. Then Constantinople fell to the Muslims in 1453. And Moscow, which became a patriarchy very soon after that, it became the third Rome that replaces Constantinople as the center of Christianity. It's not third Rome in the sense of third in importance after Rome and Constantinople. It's third in the sense of succession, meaning it's now the center of Christianity. 
And here he talks about Moscow being the, 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 the obstacle to the Antichrist, the one who holds back the catacomb. But yet he had just said two years ago that it was the papacy was. And he talks about here about Rome being deserted. Now, I don't know about you, but another word for deserted is vacant. And of course, if we say Rome is vacant, are we saying Sedi Vicantinism? Are we saying there is no valid pope? Now, be, to be clear, Vigano does not explicitly state this, but it does bring up questions, troubling questions, and it makes you wonder, does he think Pope Francis isn't the legitimate pope? Does he think Bergoglio, I should say in his word, is not the legitimate pope? And I think these are things that in a current in our current situation, if he did not think this out when he wrote that, if he's just using metaphorical language of deserted and the catacomb and things like that and third Rome, well, he should have understood that in our current environment, when so many people are questioning, so many Catholics are questioning whether or not Rome is actually, uh, if there is anybody on the seat of Rome, if the Pope is really the legitimate Pope. And I think I think these, these are things that you have to be more careful with if you're particularly if you're an archbishop. So I think that's something that's very troubling that worries me that he's he's in his efforts to fight what he thinks is the, the, the against the children of darkness, which I think he's right about a lot of that. I just want to make that clear. I think he might be starting to uh, go astray in some ways. I mean, I, I, I'm very troubled by that. And I, I, I'm I know people have been upset with crisis for publishing Michael's piece about this, but I think it's, it's right on. It's a concern we need to have that, that we need to have about what, what Vigano has been saying uh, when he talks about Moscow as a third Rome as a catacomb against the antichrist. When he had just two years ago, talked about the papacy as a catacomb against the antichrist. Now, let me just try to wrap up here with like a review of the good and the bad of, and the ugly <laughs> of Archbishop Vigano. The first thing is, obviously, Archbishop Vigano should be thanked forever for being the first to really name names when it comes to the McCarrick scandal and it comes to corruption surrounding uh, former Cardinal Theodore McCarrick. I think we need to very much understand how important that was and how vital that was and how much we should be thankful to Vigano. I wish more bishops had come out and done that because I know more bishops know stuff that's going on and they're not saying it i know there's priests who know things are going that aren't saying it i wish they would have the courage the courage of archbishop vigano to speak out like he did we can't uh, overestimate how important that was second i think it's very good that he is drawing this language of a battle going on in the world between the global elites who frankly want to destroy our world and the and the children of light too many bishops are too timid about this. If they're not actually on the side of the children of darkness, like a like a like a Cardinal Supich might be, or Cardinal Tobin, then they're timid about it. They don't want to. They don't want to look as crazy. They don't want to be looked at as conspiracy theory. But the fact of the matter is that there is a globalist uh, conspiracy. I'll use the word to remake the world. This is something they admit, and it's going to be remake the world in an image that is an anti-Christ image. I think that is very true, and I, and I commend Archbishop Vigano for stating this and making this clear. I am also very happy that he, and very much respect the fact that he's going to go. He's willing to go against the narrative. Almost every bishop goes with the narrative. By the narrative, I just wrote an article about this yesterday. A crisis, the current narrative, like whatever the media is telling us, we have to think right now. Most bishops just go along with it unthinkingly. They blindly accept it. Not Archbishop Vigano, and for that, he's to be commended. Now, I will say, let me talk about some of my criticisms of Archbishop Vigano. The first and foremost is, is that he promised us that he would reveal more about the corruption in the church, and he has not. It's been almost four years now, two, three and a half years it's been since he first set, revealed some names, and he said there was more to come. Well, we haven't gotten it. And the reason we were all supportive of Vigano in the beginning was the fact that he was willing to, to expose the corruption. That was his role is to expose the corruption in the Catholic Church. Not to necessarily talk about these the Great Reset about President Trump or about what's happening in Russia. He was placed in a, in a position to talk about or anything else about the corruption going on at the Vatican. And he did that initially, but then he pivoted away from it, and I don't know why. And I wish that he would go back to talking about that. Yes, maybe it's more dangerous for him, I don't know, but he himself has said at his age, he has to worry about his final judgment. He can't worry about forces against him if he might get assassinated or whatever the case might be. Uh, he can't worry about that. So that's the first thing I would say, a big criticism. 
I also think that if you read his his writings, I do think they're too political. What I mean by that is simply his focus is on the politics, which is fine in one sense, but he doesn't really give spiritual advice for how we resist this spiritually. He's an archbishop of the Catholic Church. His focus should be on the spiritual weapons that we use, not necessarily the political weapons that we use. That's not what we're looking for from our the successors of the apostles. In fact, most of us were very critical of Pope Francis when he delves into politics too much. I'm the first to say when, when Pope Francis starts, starts talking about climate change or whatever, I'm like, yeah, stay in your lane, your holiness, your lane, your holiness. Stop talking about all the political things and start talking about the spiritual matters. Well, I think that criticism can apply to Archbishop Vigano as well, that at times he does get too political. He needs to focus more on the spiritual world, at least the, the spiritual realities behind the politics and how we can respond to what's going on in the politics. Because most of us can't do anything about what's going on with, with the, the, the Great Reset crowd. So what can we do spiritually? He needs to talk about that a little bit more. And then finally, my um, actually two more cr criticisms of Archbishop Vigano. I, I do respect him putting things in this very stark contrast of good and evil, because there is good and evil in the world. And there are forces for good and forces for evil in the world. However, I do think he needs to be careful and not not uh, forget that most people are probably somewhere in the middle and most figures, political figures are the same way. Yeah, there are some real bad guys like your Bill Gates or your Fauci's or your Klaus Schwaber, whatever his name is, uh, who are bad guys. But I think he needs to recognize that that not everything is is as clear cut as he might make it in this world. And then my final criticism I've already talked about. I'm very troubled by his words about Moscow being the third Rome and his words about Rome being deserted. I, I think he needs to make it very clear that he thinks Francis is the Pope or make it clear he doesn't think that and give us the reasons why. But I think right now what he's doing is he's fostering Sedi Vicontinism and also, frankly, Eastern Orthodoxy. And I think those are two dangers for particularly conservative and traditional Catholics today is Sedi Vicontinism and Eastern Orthodoxy. And he's what he's saying, I think, would attract people more to those two options. And I think he should do more to tell people don't go that way. So that that would be those would be the criticisms I have of um, Archbishop Vigano. Now, so what do I think? Do I think he's prophetic? Do I think he's preposterous? Something in between? Well, I did a poll on Twitter today about that. And uh, I think most people put in between. I think it was 51% of people said he's in, somewhere in between. 34% said prophetic. And 14% said, said he's preposterous. I would put him somewhere in the middle as well. I think he's done a lot of good for the church. But I also think there's some reasons to be concerned and some legitimate criticisms against him. And I think something, my final thought is, I think as Catholics, we need to resist personalities. I think we need to resist following personalities. What I mean by that is when somebody becomes a popular commentary, commentator, whether it's a lay person or a cleric or a hierarch, I think we need to be careful. It's not that we shouldn't listen to them ever. I mean, I, I, I love to listen to Archbishop Schneider. Uh, there's a lot of uh, commentators in the Catholic world that I think that I respect and I think are great. Obviously, Crisis Magazine. That's what we do. We we make we we have people who make comments and opine about the state of the world, the state, the state of the church. I'm not saying that can't happen, but I think there's a difference between that and then raising people to personalities where you become a party Catholic that you will defend that person no matter what. What like for example, when we ran that article critical of Archbishop Vigano last week. It was critical of, of one part of what one thing he said that I think was open to criticism. It wasn't saying he's done terrible work. It's not saying we're against him. It's not saying that. Yet we got pushback from people saying they were offended that we dared to criticize him. Some were suggesting we were in league with McCarrick for doing that. Or, or we were in league with all the corruption. We wanted the corruption in the Catholic Church by criticizing Vigano. That's not how this works. That's not that that's cancel culture, frankly. Because what it's saying is if you're not 100% with me, then you're 100% against me. No, that's not true. We're with Archbishop Vigano when he's exposing corruption in the church, when he's talking about things like, for example, the, the, the COVID regime or things like that. But yes, we will oppose him or criticize him at the very least when he says things we think are, are contrary to the Catholic faith. And I think that's healthy. And I think I hope people would be, for example, critical of crisis, critical of me uh, when I do things. I, that's OK. I don't mind the criticism. But yet let's not be where we, we just cancel people 
or we do the opposite. What's the opposite of cancel? Completely wholeheartedly accept somebody no matter what, uh, no matter what they say. Every personality, quote unquote, every personality must be judged by the standard of the person of Jesus Christ. That's the person. That's the only personality that matters is Jesus Christ. Everybody has to be gauged by that standard, whether it's the Pope, whether it's Archbishop Vigano, Bishop Schneider, uh, myself, anybody, or the, you know, the, the humblest lay person has to be judged on the person, on the standard of the person of Jesus Christ. I think when we do that, I think we'll, we'll, we'll be on safe waters at that point. And so for Archbishop Vigano, I hope he continues to do some good work. And continue, and I, but honestly, what I really want is I want him to go back to exposing the corruption in the church. I think that's what we really need from him in this hour, uh, not his geopolitical views, to be honest. That's what I think. And I think we, we need to be very careful not to attach ourselves to any personality because anybody can fall. We, I mean, if you've been involved in the Catholic world for, for as long as I have, you can see this, you know, from Father Carapi uh, to Father Maciel uh, to others. If you get too much behind a certain personality, that personality can fall, can can go astray, and we don't want to we don't want to be caught uh, with the baggage if that happens. Follow Jesus Christ, and any of His followers when they are faithful to Jesus Christ, you can follow them as well. But otherwise, be be willing to be critical of them. Okay, I'm going to wrap it up. Well, we went long today. I'm going to wrap it up there. I really appreciate you staying with us here. Uh, like I said at the beginning, please like and subscribe to our channel if you like what we're doing here. Uh, follow us on social media at Crisis Mag. And until next time, everybody, God love you.